So it gives me great pleasure to share this fabulous panel celebrating Essex Hemphill's poetry. Um, in this reading, we have in the house Philip Clark. We have Michelle Parkerson. And we got Layson Jones in the house. And concluding this celebration of Essex Hemphill's poetry, we are so honored to have in the house Martin Duberman. We will um, read from this latest work. So um, I will read uh, some poems from Essex, Essex, Essex's collection, Ceremonies, and I will conclude with one of my own poems. I started to write poetry in 1993, and that's where I met Essex Temple in New York City. And uh, when I read his poetry and when I saw him perform, he inspired me uh, to, to be audacious, to be sexual, to uh, confront race. These are some of the poems that have um, influenced me and have stuck with me. And Essex is not here right now, but his poetry is. And uh, so um, this is an honor of Essex. This is Black Beans. Times are lean, pretty baby. The beans are burnt to the bottom of the battered pot. Let's make fierce love on the overstuffed hand-me-down sofa. We can burn it up too. Our hungers will evaporate like money. I smell your lust, not the pot burnt black with tonight's meager meal, so we can't buy flowers for our table. Our kisses are petals. Our tongues caress the bloom. Who dares to tell us we are poor and powerless? We keep treasure any king would count as dear. Come on, pretty baby. Our souls can't be crushed like cats crossing streets too soon. Let the beans burn all night long. Our chipped water glasses are filled with wine from our loving and the burnt black beans caviar. In the life. Mother, do you know I roam alone at night? I wear colognes, tight pants, and chains of gold as I search for men willing to come back to candlelight. I'm not scared of these men, though some are killers of sons like me. I learned there is no tender mercy for men of color, for sons who love men like me. Do not feel shame for how I live. I chose this tribe of warriors and outlaws. Do not feel that you failed some test of motherhood. My life has borne fruit no woman could have given me anyway. If one of these thick-lipped, wet black nights, while I'm out walking, I find freedom in this village, if I can take it with my tribe, I'll bring you here. And you will never notice the absence of rice and bridesmaids. Isn't it funny? I don't want to hear you beg. I'm sick of beggars. If you a man take what you want from me or what you can, even if you have me like some woman across town you think you love, look at me standing here with my dick as straight as yours. What do you think this is? The weathercock on a rooftop? <laughs> we sneak all over town like two damn thieves whiskey on our breath, no street lights on the back roads, just the stars above us, as ordinary as they should be. We always have to work it out, walk it through, talk it over, drink and smoke our way into sodomy. I could take you in my room, but you're afraid the landlady will recognize you. I feel thankful I don't love you. I won't have to suffer you later on. But for now, I say, Johnny Walker. Have you had enough, Johnny Walker? Do I look like a woman now? Against the fogged glass, fogged car glass? Do I look like your crosstown lover? Do I look like Shirley? When you reach to kiss her lips, they're thick like mine. Her hair is cut close to, like mine, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you.
And I will read one more of Essex Hemphill's poetry, and I will close with one of my own. Um, pressing flats. You want to sleep on my chest? You want to listen to my heartbeat all through the night? It's the only jazz station, like a 24-hour signal. If you want to listen, if you answer yes, I expect you to be able to sleep in a pit of cobras. You should be willing to destroy your enemy if it comes to that. If you have a weapon, if you know how to use your hands, you should be able to distinguish oppression from pleasure. Some pleasure is oppression, but then that isn't pleasure, is it? Some drugs induce pleasure, but isn't that oppression? If you're immobilized, you're oppressed. If you're killing yourself, you're oppressed. If you don't know who you are, you're oppressed. A prayer candle won't always solve the confusion. The go-go won't always take the mind off things. Our lives don't get better with coke. They just get away from us. There doesn't have to be a bomb if we make up our minds. We don't want to die that way. We're told what's right from the left. We're told there is good and evil, laws and punishment. But no one speaks of the good in evil or the evil in good. You want to sleep on my chest. You want to listen to my heartbeat all through the night. It's the only jazz station with a 24-hour signal. If you want to listen, if you know what I mean. I figured out what kind of guys are attracted to me. They're usually anthropologists. Because they're into my bone structure. <laughs> I'll be at a bar and this guy will come up to me and he'll stare at me like I'm on the cover of National Geographic. And he'll say, could I tell you something real personal? You remind me of an Aztec priest. <laughs> well, that gives me a boner. Uh, why don't I sacrifice your kitten to Montezuma? Are you Cortez? And he'll say, you Orientals, you got the best skin. What do you use? Well, we use pillow cream. <laughs> he buys me a glass of draft bass and asks if I am Japanese. His remarks, you are the perfect combination of boy and man. No, I am not Japanese, but are you the hip, hot, hog nine inches of fun, seeking the slim, smooth, smiling, authentically pie-tasting, geisha guy on the side, macho dancer looking for his lord and master, and butterfly wedding banquet joy fuck club? I am not a Korean dragon lady running down Avenue A on heels with a teapot between my legs shouting, where's my tip? Give me my trophy. You want to play with me? You can. Just quit orientalizing, because I ain't going to change my continent calvins for you or my mother if I lose. I ain't going to fry you an emperor's meal, or throw you Eurasia, or butterfly you an opera. I'm through giving sex tours of UNICEF countries. The <laughs> third world is for Angelina Jolie, Madonna, and Fat Sally Struthers. See, I am not a, a, a a teriyaki toy, a rice queen's dream, a bowl of soy sauce to dip your meat in. Hit me and watch where the mahjong chips land. Lust me, I'll soon feel the back of your hand. Play with me then if you think the sweet that's left of a taste in my tongue is not enough bitter. Love me for this, I forfeit the game. Remove my makeup and call you the winner. <laughs> I would not have been able to write that poem without Essex's courage, so, um, so thank you. And now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next reader. He's a co-editor of an incredible anthology, Persistent Voices, Poetry by Writers Lost to AIDS, and A Kind of Endlessness, The Selected Poems of Donald Britton. Um, he's on the board of directors for the Rainbow History Project. I'm so excited to hear he's here. Let's give a big center outright welcome for the one and only very handsome philip clark yeah. <laughs> and um, i'm single and available so if you want to talk to me afterwards <laughs> <laughs> philip 
are you available and single? I am single. Oh, cool. <laughs> Well, I don't know exactly how I'm supposed to follow all of that, but uh, I'll see what I can do. Um, <laughs> um, I first uh, found uh, Essex's work on the bookshelves of the Arlington County Public Library. Uh, his book, Ceremonies, was in the collection there. And at the point that I first read it, I was 15 years old, and I was a scrawny, suburban, middle-class, white kid living about five miles as the crow flies from some of the locales that Essex talks about in his poetry and his essays. Now I'm 34, and as you can see, I'm still a scrawny, <laughs> suburban, <laughs> middle-class white kid. <laughs> now living about 10 miles as the crow flies from some of the locations Essex talks about in his poems and his essays. So externally, nothing has changed, but uh, internally? I was very, very pleased at the point that I was able to start editing Persistent Voices to include some of Essex's work uh, in the anthology. And uh, this first poem that I'm going to read was published uh, in Persistent Voices. Gay marriage is a big topic right now. Had you heard? <laughs> and uh, I don't know what I think about gay marriage as sort of like an end goal for the movement, but uh, I do know what I think about this poem. I love this poem, and uh, it is called American wedding. In America, I place my ring on your cock where Woo! it belongs. No horsemen bearing terror, no soldiers of doom will swoop in and sweep us apart. They're too busy looting the land to watch us. They don't know we need each other critically. They expect us to call in sick, watch television all night, die by our own hands. They don't know we are becoming powerful. Every time we kiss, we confirm the new world coming. What the rose whispers before blooming, I vow to you. I give you my heart, a safe house. I give you promises other than milk, honey, liberty. I assume you will always be a free man with a dream. In America, place your ring on my cock where it belongs. Long may we live to free this dream. Since I'm really more of a nonfiction writer than a poet at this point, I figured I would uh, do a quick essay of Essex's. Uh, it takes place up the hill and a few streets over in Mount Pleasant, where he was living at the time. And uh, the essay is called, If I Simply Wanted Status, I'd Wear Calvin Klein. <laughs> I have never been a slave to fashion, so it was simply rash of me to think I could boldly wear my fireball red fag club t-shirt in public and not be confronted. I had purchased the t-shirt in San Francisco without any hesitation whatsoever. In fact, I purchased two t-shirts the red athletic tee, and the black crew neck, both bearing fag club, prominently displayed in bold white letters across the front. Mind you, the day I wore that t-shirt all over Washington, D.C., I was truly voguing. <laughs> I was featuring heavy transgression in a town of government secrets, political intrigue, and kinky sex. The confrontation did not occur downtown or on the bus or subway, as I thought it might. I was in my neighborhood, Mount Pleasant, when it happened. People I had encountered on the buses and downtown sidewalks didn't challenge me. They were surprised by the t-shirt, as indicated by the number of double takes it received. The red was tinted with a little orange and was very eye-catching in the summer sun. By the time I returned to Mount Pleasant later that afternoon, I had completely forgotten I was wearing it. I had never flaunted my sexuality so immediately to so many. I had never communicated my sexual identity so intentionally as I did by choosing to wear that fag club t-shirt in public. I needed to get a few things for dinner before going home, so I stopped at the supermarket a few blocks from my apartment. As the market doors swooshed behind me and I passed through the entrance turnstile, a young boy screamed out, look everybody, there's a faggot in the store. 
<laughs> you would have thought people were supposed to start diving to the floor. I stopped only for an instant to look over my shoulder to see whom he was calling out. <laughs> Seeing no one behind me, when I looked ahead again, I realized everyone was looking at me. I then remembered I was wearing Fag Club, emblazoned on my chest like the name of a superhero. I immediately stepped forward in full control of my location and presence of mind. I knew this scene must have looked very funny, but I was determined to keep my composure. There were little bursts of laughter here and there, but nothing too serious. I glided down the aisles, completing my short grocery list and avoiding direct eye contact until I reached the checkout line. There, the clerk looked at my t-shirt and smiled. I smiled back at her. Then she turned and began ringing up my groceries. Mm. Just then, the young boy who had shouted, there's a faggot in the store, came up to me from the exit of the checkout line. He was a curly-haired, 10-year-old black boy. Hey, mister, I have a cousin like you. He's gay, too. He continued approaching until he was standing beside me. I looked into his face and saw no fear, no hatred, no disgust. Did you get that in Washington, he asked, pointing to my t-shirt? My cousin would like one of those. <laughs> he was not the least bit shy in telling me this. He looked me directly in the eye, waiting for my response. No, I didn't get this in Washington, I told him. I got it in San Francisco. You can get them there. I thought so, he said. I didn't think you'd get a t-shirt like that in DC. I like it. See ya. Then he turned and left. I stood there momentarily disarmed by his candor and only a little self-conscious about my interaction with him. How he appeared to the others watching us did cross my mind. But then I thought, if I simply wanted status, I could wear Calvin Klein, strike a pose. That's safe. <laughs> I don't know if they're coming. I don't know if they're going to be coming up individually or separately, separately together. A little bit of both, but uh, we're very uh, lucky to have uh, tonight. Do you want to do this introduction, Reggie? Yeah. You, you do a little more. Let, let, there are some chairs in front. Come on up. Let's give it up for Philip Clark, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Philip Clark. Yeah. Reggie has a little more pop than I do, so I'm going to let him introduce Wayson and Michelle. Um, so. Um, next up, um, we have, first of all, I just want to give a shout out to Dan Vera. Um, I don't know if he's here, but we had a small reading of this earlier in April. Um, was it April or May? April. In National April, Poetry. for National Poetry Month. And it's, it's, so I mean, thank you, Dan. And um, I had the pleasure of reading with Michelle at the, at the event. Um, Michelle Parkerson is a writer, filmmaker, university professor, and performance artist extraordinaire. Uh, from Washington, D.C. In 2007, she received a Black Lily Film and Music Festival Living Legend Award and is it currently in development on a new docudrama entitled Sis Anna about African-American educator, political visionary, and early feminist scholar Anna Julia Cooper. Let's give a big warm round of applause for Michelle Parkerson. <laughs> Michelle, welcome. So glad you came. We're so glad that you're going to continue coming the whole weekend for Outright Festival. Yes? Yes. yes? yes, yes, yes. There's a lot to say about the many facets of who Essex Hemphill was, is, and I'm really glad that Martin Duberman had the moxie and the flagrance to take on a dual biography and give you some essence of Essex Hemphill. It's a marvelous book. The structure is phenomenal as well. And uh, I know that you will love it. And Martin, I look forward to hearing you after we're done. Uh, Essex was a really good friend of mine. He was a creative co-conspirator. He was a, one of the early feminist men I ever met. Um, DC homeboy, you know, who would serve it to you. Poetry, prose, essays, performance. And he was an international revelation in the 1980s and 90s in terms of exposing black male voice, brother to brother love, okay, black gay, gay male voice, and also for younger LGBT writers, the breadth and possibility of what lies ahead in their writing, in our writing ahead of us. 
um, I always have Essex's presence in my memory as, you know, like this glow, this outburst of laughter, uh, very brilliant, very irreverent, charming, charming, charming. It, you just, you know, every fickle, flirtatious, he was without equal in that particular category. So I, um, I would say that most importantly, Essex, at the confluence of race and sexual politics, just to give you this part, innovative performance, confession and confrontation made it plain, speak up, speak out, but damn it, speak. Uh, I don't know if many of you knew Essex in terms of him being a graphic artist. Uh, he used to do his own wonderful chapbooks uh, before he was picked up by independent uh, publishing houses and major publishing houses toward the end of his life. And I'd like to read from one of them called Diamonds Was in the Kitty, just the opening of it. The Mississippi washed him into town with wild cards in his pocket. A tall black gypsy, he touched her life and dreams through the cards. He promised her no ordinary farm beside the river. He gave her no dreams of cows to milk or crops to tend. On this June evening, she sits beside him at the card table. She doesn't understand his hand. Here she is, Miss Otis's proud daughter, keeping company in a gambling saloon with a man who talks like he's been everywhere she dreams. He talks like he steals into her sleep and slips off with the names of places she longs to go. Mamie Lee looks at him, all dressed in black. She compares him to the other men in the room. I got the best one here she prides herself. I believe there are diamonds in that kitty, just like my Jim said. My hands itching to turn the cards over and see. Her dreams was in the kitty. Black silk dresses, walking pumps for Sundays, little hats with veils that made her eyes secrets. She could see herself riding down the road beside Blackjack in a red roadster. And anyhow, she often asks, who wants to keep a damn old farm by a muddy river? River so temperamental and mean, it'll flood you out while you sleep. Who wants to land? Who wants to fuss and fight with that land? Pray the cops come up green in the spring. I don't care no more for dreams in the mud. I want you to go north, see the city lights, my Jim be telling me about it whispering into my breasts about the things diamonds can buy a woman. I want to see New York, Boston, Chicago. I want to dance all night to that sweet jazz Jim be humming. I want to be a pretty gal. Let the city flood me out like this river so I can forget my country ways. Diamonds was in the kitty for Miss Otis's baby girl. It's 10 o'clock at night. She's sitting in a gambling saloon. She, like a wild petunia, in Black Jack Jim's tailored lapel. That's how it opens. <laughs> alpha disruptions, alpha wave disruptions. Television is watching us, counting us like fingers while we sleep our homelands disappear. Urban pioneers plant landmines beneath flower beds. I bought a bomb downtown, a kiss, some drugs, all of this can kill. The police stop me at a roadblock, ask me where I live. I tell them anywhere I can, off a bitch, on a bench, on a grate. They want proof. They arrest me for having none. They suspect I'm a non-person. I tell them I come from Earth. They choke me at my collar and tell me no such place exists. They set no bail for my life. They assign my organs and brains to the state. They assign my flesh to the lamp factory. Satellites are listening to us. 
We are never alone, but we are lonely and lonesome. We are being watched by infrared eyes. We are being listened to by sonar ears. A microchip is more valuable than a heart. And silicone doesn't bleed, 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 bleed. Better days. Y'all remember that club? Yeah. Better days? Yeah. In daytime hours guided by instincts that never sleep, the faintest signals come to me over vast spaces of etiquette and restraint. Sometimes I give in to the pressing call of instinct, knowing the code of my kind better than I know the national anthem or the Lord's Prayer. I'm so driven by my senses to abandon restraint, to seek pure pleasure through every pore. I want to smell the air around me, thickly scented with a playboy's freedom. I want impractical relationships. I want buddies and partners, names I will forget by sunrise. I don't want to commit my heart. I only want to feel good. I only want to freak sometimes. Mm -hmm. There are no other considerations. A false safety compels me to think I will never need kindness. So I don't recognize that need in someone else. But it concerns me going off to sleep and waking, throbbing with wants that I'm being consumed by want, and I wonder where stamina comes from to search all night until my footsteps ring awake the sparrows, and I go home, ghost walking, driven indoors to rest, my hunter's guise to love myself as fiercely as I have in better days. I just wanna... read a poem I wrote for Essex uh, when we first became friends. Uh, it's called High Wire. And then I'd like to bring Wayson Jones to the podium so we can create some of that voice scapes technique. High Wire. We poise above teetering earth defying limitation. Mere lines suspend us. We do not know fear. A precision for danger instructs our hand. Chaperones the passions propelling us. Partners, skin to skin, flung vast beyond gender. The sweaty grip of spirit is all that joins us. Sequined cape. We test precarious air. <laughs> I have to bring up Wayson Jones. <clears throat> P.S. 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 Dear motherfucking dreams, what's the matter with these goddamn miracles today? They don't appear fresh. They look thawed out, glassy-eyed, marked down. Who wants these shabby-ass miracles? Who can be saved by these shadows of offering? Who can last a day on this? <laughs> You know, it's like, it's like the greatest hits album when all the hits are like really, really great. Because yeah. I'm sitting here and I'm, 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 I'm hearing these poems and I'm sort of saying them along um, uh, with the readers. Um, I'm going to really dispense with a lot of the commentary that I was going to make in the interest of time, but um, you know, I think most of you know that I was Essex's long time performance partner and really lifelong friend for 20 years from our meeting at 
University of Maryland in 1975 until his death in uh, 1995. Um, this story, you know, I told to Martin, and it's in the book. Um, I had already moved as a music major. I was already on campus in our single dorm room that somehow they put the two of us, the two of us in, not knowing what they wrought, you know, <laughs> when, they, when they did that ultimately. But I was well ensconced in the room, uh, like an early week, like the football teams do, because I was in the marching band. So Essex comes in, and no sooner, literally, than he had walked through the door, and I'm seated. In all my 18-year-old self-possession, I say to him, well, you know, I'm gay, so if that's not cool with you, maybe you should uh, think about finding another roommate. It only occurred to me um, Wednesday, actually, the supreme irony of my saying that in all my brash self-containment to the man who would come a, become a giant in gay letters, if you will, over the course of the next few decades. Um, <clears throat> amid a thick haze of marijuana smoke, we became uh, close friends immediately. We really, I mean, we really bonded in um, a lot of ways just in terms of personality, cultural sharing. He shared his poetry with me um, very soon. Um, he wasn't really out at that point, um, whereas I was a very active uh, Gay Student Alliance member, going and speaking to psychology 100 classes with amphitheater style 200 uh, uh, student seating. Um, I don't remember if I shared that with him. I think I may have told him about that. Um, so when we when we gave our, our uh, presentation at uh, the library, I, I broached the fact that, you know, in all the years and all the stature that he achieved, I wondered if somehow I wasn't one of those seed persons. You know, we have those seed people who no one can make you come out, but they plant those little seeds without even saying anything. They're like, let's go dancing, let's go to this club, or let's, there's a party, my friends are having a party. And I did, I think, I, I think that I may have provided him his first gay social experiences. Um, that said, um, you know, after the year of our, our, um, <coughs> our friendship and roommateship, and Essex uh, decamping to Los Angeles, where he, I think, did his real coming out, he came back and um, uh, became active in the, in the local poetry scene. He was a member of uh, a poetry collective called um, Station to Station. And, and that group was the first time I heard him read publicly. And this is the piece that he read. It's called Balloons. In black plastic bags tied at the top, they were buried. Their faces swollen with death rise in my dreams. I was 17 when I read of them. Young boys, young men lured to a house in Texas. Their penises were filled with excited blood First hard, then soft they became, as death with its blistered lips kissed them one by one. They were grapes on death's parched tongue. In plastic bags tied at the top, they were buried. 25 of them and more unclaimed, young boys, young men. For a long time, I was afraid to trust loving a man. For a long time, I retreated to women. But it was like dancing, following a pattern of steps painted on the floor. Now, the awkward dancing is over. For three days, I have walked by a dark gray house at the end of my street where lives a man out of whose home I have seen young boys, young men, coming and going, coming and going. And for three days, from the second floor windows, music from dusk to dusk has fallen like petals of black roses softly to the ground. But tonight, evening of the third day. I call the police and tell them, not about faces rising like balloons. I tell them instead about music, petals of black roses falling softly to the ground. Perhaps they will understand. Maybe they will come to my street and knock at the door of the gray house where lives this man I have not seen for three days, whose face is beginning to rise 
in my dreams like balloons. You know, I have to tell you guys, um, this is difficult for me to do, actually. Um, I learned recently of the, um, the concept called self-object. Um, does anyone have a tissue or anything? Um, the self-object being a person who, who acts as a mirror. <laughs> who acts as an emotional mirror for you. It goes beyond mentorship. It's the person who, whose presence is formative for you, the person in whom you see yourself and, 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 and in whose presence you're formed as the person you are, and that's what he was for me. So when your self-object is gone, you know, even after all these years, um, I can only deal with the grief in, in, in packets. You know, every once in a while, which are spurred by having to, to do these kind of events, I read the poetry. I'm going to tell you guys, sometimes I can just pick up the book and look at the book and, and, and the tears come. I have to say that because I, <clears throat> I need to kind of issue a disclaimer so you don't think I'm just sort of <clears throat> up here be, being dramatic and falling apart. Um, and it's not that at all. Um, but I've also said, you know, um, as many of you know, Essex was a seer. He saw things. He saw things in himself. He saw things in the world and other people. And he spoke about those things. You know, everyone is, I think, familiar with the political aspect of that. But um, to me, it went much deeper than that. Um, you know, I was glad that Michelle read from Diamonds and the Kitty because it shows sort of the cultural breadth of, of the things that he, he addressed. Um, and he wrote about love in ways, to me, that I haven't really heard other poets do. Uh, this piece is called Romance is Intrigue. Amid conflicting reports, the truth emerges, coarse-edged an ungentle blade for peeling back the night's skin in no way an easy task. It requires great strength in the hands, a strength not as obvious as muscles. So I watch you through the eyes of people I love. The good and the bad they tell me, I hear. I believe what I feel moves unsaid in the air between us. This is not like trains or lunch or gossip. A brown stone gap-toothed griot girl like you should understand. This is not via satellite. My arms are still attached, but empty. You do not lay slain in a lover's ambush. Amid conflicting reports, satellite blackouts, it is true. Some of the people we love are terrorists. Um, I'm going to read just one more piece. Um, I almost feel guilty getting applause, you know, because there's so much. Um, even though I, I, I alluded to grief, there's just so much joy for me in, in, in reading these poems and, and doing uh, meditations, um, which in retrospect I, <laughs> I dedicate to Barack Obama and John Boehner um, uh, <laughs> together. Um, I had the honor and the privilege through the, through the time that I knew Essex um, of being one of the persons, um, I'm sure Michelle was one as well, who he shared the drafts of his manuscripts with and, and, and accepted and welcomed feedback. Um, he put together a um, collection about a year before his death that he called Domestic Life. Um, I'll read you the note that he wrote me when he, uh, when he sent it to me. July 23rd, 1994. Dear Wason, enclosed is some of what I've been working on. As always, any comments you might want to give 
Any feedback will be appreciated. It feels wonderful to be writing again. I have sorely missed putting pen to paper. I hope your creativity is flowing and flourishing. Take care of your blessings, Eve. Sorting through my lonely corruptions, I rake the teeth of a comb through my tangled life, my objectives still unclear. Something compels me to consider other ways of living, even as I face an impending death, the only train I know that will one day definitely arrive. When? I have no idea. A seer I am not and I do not eagerly anticipate its arrival, nor do I dread the seat that waits for me, nor the window that will reflect my face. Sorting through my corruptions, a bundle of photographs, sorting leaves of spinach, there is no difference to me. The act of sorting leads to order, clarifies, defines, creates memory. I am defined by my, by my corruptions as surely as I am defined by my best deeds. But there is something nagging to speak, something else that has had no voice until now. I listen to it calling my name, clearly, gently calling me. I answer tentatively. I have suspicions and doubts. But I answer because I think it's God or the distant whistle of my train. Thank you.